but there are some archives which recall his going to Paris in 1639 for the French King Louis XIII. He worked on daylight scenes in the external light until 1630s, and after that he moved on to night scenes with lighting pictures, such as candles or lanterns, sometimes also torches. Section 1. St. Joseph the Carpenter. The picture was rediscovered in 1938 in the collection of English merchant Percy Moore Turner and published for the first time in 1939 in the paper written by Paul Chan, a creator of Moore School Museum. And in 1948, it comes into the collection of the Louvre and this important tableau represents the child Christ illuminating his adoptive father Joseph working on his carpentry. Joseph is bending over to drill the rectangular timber underneath him. As is often pointed out, two pieces of wood positioned crisscross on the ground to signify the future Christ's passion. On the ground, there lie a chisel, a wooden hammer, and a piece of wood, a piece of wood shavings, and in, in the background, there extends deep darkness typical of the artist. Joseph's gaze at Christ seems to express some kind of sorrow of, for the future passion of his son. Major research agreed in dating it between 1638 to 1645. There is a variant for this composition in the Museum of Bouzanson in a slightly smaller size. Again, as in underground, the tragedy and farce are shown to be inherent to the Balkans' way of life, and the film is undoubtedly self-balkanizing and an example of Balkanism. But this time, this heavy mix serves a better purpose. The professional asserts that since power takeovers are revealed to be nominal rather than real, as the new power continues with the practices of the previous one, uh, Pera is shown to be monitored also by the new post Milosevic security forces. The only ray of hope can be found in the resistance to the power, and this resistance may re emerge from personal ties that bind us. The security officer, who seems to be terminally ill now, informs Thea he also once saved his life because his daughter was infatuated with her, with her literature, literature professor, Thea. And before leaving for hospital, from where he might not ever return, the officer asks Thea to phone his daughter and tell her that they parted amicably. And to conclude, in Dusan Kovacevic's post-Yugoslav screenplays, farce is abundantly added to the tragedies usually attributed to and shown in the films about the disintegration of Yugoslavia and the 1990s transition period. However, in Kovacevic's post-Yugoslav scripts, farce does not follow tragedy, rather they are shown to be two sides of the same coin two complementary ways of addressing the Yugoslav and post-Yugoslav reality. If anything, in underground, it is solemn tragedy that follows a careful balance of farce and tragedy, but not without a win. The, the, the Latin word for mirror is speculum. Uh, with the same word, one can also refer to a, a medieval genre of encyclopedic literature, uh, prominent from from 12th to 16th century, speculum pieces are understood as summaries or surveys of fragmented knowledge, meticulously collected within a single document. Mapai Mundi are basic, basically graphic speculums. They are products of accumulative uh, thinking that is far removed from the systematic character of our modern spatial rhythm. How then can the supposedly modern notion of landscape be linked to the medieval cartographic curiosities of Mapai Mundi as my title initially suggests? The following images will, will attempt to, to restore the medieval conceptions of, of space to a historic continuum that overcomes the distinction between the Middle Ages and modernity, suggesting that in 
immersion into in deeper relations of landscape, earth, and cosmos can have a, a profound effect on modern concerns of spatiality. Umberto Eco suggested that a permanent rediscovery of the Middle Ages sets an almost ontological condition for all modernity, one that is almost as prevalent, though antithetical, to the ideal set by classicism. Were we to subtract the theological determination from the heart of medieval thinking, we would be left with an arch combinatorial, a practice that produces meaningful association and vicinity, where each element is understood in allegorical association with what comes before and after it. In that sense, Mabai Mundi cannot be viewed as a reflection of our experience, but they may be viewed as the inverted image of a landscape presented within the, the walls of a camera obscura. However, in the face of the near totalist nature of sensology, one could raise the question whether sensology might contain within itself excessive moments that allow for a battle to be waged precisely at the level of sensology, that is, at the very external and reified level that is constitutive of the impersonal or subjective sentient experience of contemporary sensology with its quasi public space of the already felt and the privatism of mass communication. Can you identify what he calls neo ancient sensibility as one of these um, uh, excessive moments, which are characterized by indistinctness of thinking and feeling, in which not only the metaphysical pluralism of thinking slash activity and feeling slash receptivity is neutralized, but in which making oneself feel becomes the very condition of experience and difference that manifests, uh, manifests itself as slash in the world. Neo ancient sensibility sketches therefore an anonymous, non subjective, an indifferent or disinterested feeling that contains the possibility for a new distribution of the sensible produced via the neutralization of the hierarchical dualisms of thinking slash feeling, organic slash inorganic, activity slash receptivity, subject slash world that are characteristic of sensology, which after all is nothing else but the fully realized figure of metaphysical activism and its attendant insensibility. Moreover, the suspension of the distinction between the organic and inorganic operative in the neo ancient feeling of difference is crucial for any attempt to reinstate the symbolic order against the reified public realm and its shadow of imaginary communication. In other words, the excess of primary aesthetics allowing for the transformation of the sensological communicative distribution of the sensible into a genuine symbolic order is to be sought in the habitus quotem forms rituals, that is, in those called dimensions that represent an inorganic corporeality. Ultimately, all the forms and rituals, with their relative opacity and inexpressiveness, can reopen the symbolic space for sentient experiences and behaviors that might no longer be overwritten by either the already felt or privatized, individualized sentiment. In the process of concentrating on literary creation after its independence, it's inevitable to touch upon many issues related to literary creation. Finally, it converges and condenses into a very rich and interesting theory of literary creation elements in Chinese classical, in Chinese classical literary theory, especially that of the Qin dynasty. The significance lies in the following aspects. First, it's a correction of the opposing views such as thought and affection, inspiration and force, purpose and non-purpose, and so on. Second, paying too much emphasis on the irrationality of non-purpose will inevitably lead to the biased cognition of literary creation, which is simplistic, mystical, and one-sided, while the theory of the elements of literary creation is an important argument to this. So, it's also the concretization of connotation for the group category, such as purpose, non purpose, and having an alternative. 
I think if we take Hegel for serious, we also have to bear in mind that these no motives of absolute spirit are much more intertwined than to be shown just as an hierarchic um, um, linear thinking. That is that would, would still be part of, of uh, thinking of representation which he wants to overcome. So it would be the duty, our duty to to reread uh, this chapter of absolute spirit also in other direction back from religion to art, from philosophy to religion, and, and uh, so on. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think you are completely right, and I fully agree with that. Obviously, in this limited space, I could just go for the very schematic presentation, art, religion, philosophy, because, you know, it would take more time, as you say, to do this job of reassessing the links between these forms and deconstructing this hierarchical form. And I completely agree that also Hegel, obviously, presents the encyclopedia that you mentioned as a circle. So once we are at the end, we come again to the beginning. So there is a circularity. So in a sense, this uh, deconstructs the idea of the hierarchy. So I completely agree with you on this. However, we should never forget that this is only possible from the standpoint of philosophy. It's only because for Hegel, we have a complete system of philosophy that we can operate with the deconstruction. The deconstruction would not be possible from the perspective of art and revealed religion. And this is one of the reasons why I argue that the primacy of philosophy in this sense is, first of all, a metaphilosophical commitment to the idea of subjective freedom. But for the rest, I can be with you. Thank you very much. The screech is great. Um, so Harold Bloom published a book on the personality of Lear in 2018, and his title leaves no room for doubt. It's called Lear, the great image of a so, uh, but it is of course Shakespeare's text itself that invites us to think Lear in terms of authority. I'd like to just read uh, three lines from, from, uh, from Shakespeare. Kent, the loyal Kent under disguise, denies the to Lear and says, so Kent says, you have that in your countenance which I would fain call master. What's that, asked Lear? Kent replies, authority. So authority, according to Kant, is, is inscribed in the countenance, in the very features of Lear's face. But what is so interesting about the figure of, of, of Lear is that he seems to be standing at the very edge of an abyss from the very beginning of the play. Whether it is by his own foolishness, or by the malice of others, or indeed by the forces of nature, Lear's authority is constantly on the verge of dissipating it. In fact, we are invited to watch the tragic spectacle of the reduction of a powerful figure, of a powerful king, not a thing, into absolute nothingness. Now, the argument here is that it is precisely because of this constant threat of imploding that Lear's authority appears all the more pronounced and all the more tragic. And if we were to give a name to this abyss, the word that keeps popping up at the very uh, at the key moments of the play is the word nothing. The fool keeps reminding Lear that he is nothing, or that he has nothing, or that he has become nothing. And here we have a history in image seeking the freedom ideal, liberty's ideal, regarding the classic art with contemporary major transmitted reality. And uh, the second war and uh, my revolution six to eight also from French revolution and here work and student revolution my six to eight also the characters related to the same imposter in Berlin, in Germany, the victor is statue. And as this one, by analyzing the current artistic dynamics, so uh, the, the Spiegel, the Spiegel, uh, the, the, the magazine, does not want to provoke anybody with this cover, but uh, uh, as stated, the executive editor and editor in chief, 
they are defending democracy in serious times. Because of this, they have this cover. And the last image that got viral in the internet was this female image in the same position, seeking of victory and liberty. So, that was by analyzing the current artistic dynamics through aesthetic and ecology and contextualizing image production, techniques and means prevailing in the epoch it is created. Discernment of ideological discourse becomes a fundamental of coming to a significant answer of all. Hope, the feeling of freedom arises and encourages respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. That's all. Thank you very much. The upgrading and regeneration of the area has been a matter of concern to the Greek government many times with the main proposals concerning opening new roads that will facilitate the establishment of enterprises and general Greek industrialization. Eleonas is the site of a large refugee camp of those flying from Africa and Middle East. And it also hosts the famous marketplace of the scavengers. So this place was actually chosen because it constitutes an intensely fragmented and discontinuous fashion condition and also gathers all the rejected desires of the city. Literally and metaphorically, the space lacks memory and therefore it does not exactly have the identity of a place. It is literally a network of movement flows with different fluctuations. So according to these flow charts, we have chosen to concentrate at the marketplace of the scavengers. This is a situation that expands the space and involves flows of subjects and objects in a very dynamic way. The main categories for the collection of objects are shoes, clothes, toys, house decoration, tools and appliances. The main categories for the collection of objects are virtually placed in a graphic capsule as you can see here. Then, these graphic capsules are installed in the urban fabric of the Leonard's camp. And here you can see an example of how these are going to be placed in space. So, the main action of the experiment is the collection of individual descriptions that you see here, and parts of objects through the movement of the subject in the study area, and the composition of the parts in the whole. The whole, through the coherent narrative of the desire of the individual, is reimagined and acquires a new structure. Each subject can do the following. Select the logical description and individual components, and assign elements of the corresponding logical description to conceptual, mnemonic, and more emotional descriptions that express desirable intentions. In a nutshell, music displays different changing pictures over time, whereas paintings don't. Because of this intrinsic link with temporality, music would be more directly connected to subjective life and in general, uh, in general and in particular, more suitable for expressing psychological states that in turn develop and change over time. This is the uh, analogy that um, uh, Alessandro was mentioning earlier. Nevertheless, we can say that is not primar primarily responsible for musical expressiveness, and we explicitly follow Giovanni Piano, trying to do justice to his phenomenological approach. That is, not only do we admit that time is a necessary element for the existence of music, as it is for many, if not all, things, but we are obviously convinced that music entertains a special relationship with time. According to Piano, uh, who wrote uh, in his Philosophia della Musica, Music's peculiar relation to time consists in that it exhibits temporality, as opposed to what, more trivially, takes time to be experienced. In Piano's words, time is a phenomenological determination of music, whereas it is not a phenomenological determination of pictures. More specifically, music makes us experience time. It puts us directly in perceptual contact with it, by virtue of, it, of its structure, made up of passages from one sound to another, and in music, duration, uh, duration is concretely manifested in perception. Unlike in the case of paintings, with music, uh, with music, it makes sense to talk about simultaneous and successive sounds, since simultaneity and successions are objective constituent of music, whereas they are at best qualitative.
qualities of our experience of painting. Music is therefore a processual object that is con constituted by time and experience as such. Now, since the passages are not just a just that post randomly, that they are rather characterized by an internal coherence, Fiona suggests that as movements in space attract our gaze, so the sounds that follow one another in musical passages attract our auditory attention by virtue of their directionality. It is by virtue of this perceived tension between the sounds that we pay attention to the music, grasping its intrinsic organization from which expressiveness emerges. So, contrary to what Fiona takes to be a common but superficial view, the temporality that is constitutive of music is not responsible for its expressive potential. Rather, it is its intrinsic dynamism that makes it expressive, and as a consequence of its capacity to catch our attention, makes us experience temporality. Following the ceasefire of the third Arab Israeli war in June 1967, Jerusalem Mayor Jerry Kolek initiated the development, beautification, and restoration of the city of Jerusalem. In 1969, a colleague invited more than 40 renowned outstanding friends of Jerusalem from Europe, North and South America, Asia, and Africa to form the Jerusalem Committee, the World Advisory Council, concerned with the future physical and cultural development of the city. Amongst those members were such prominent intellects and cultural figures of the 20th century as Heinrich Theodor Ball, Louis Manfred, uh, Louis Manfred Sir Nicholas Pepsner, and Ursula Niva, a wife of the famed theologian Leinhold Niva, as well as the well established practitioners of art and design Mario Claver, Philip Johnson, Louis Kahn, Oscar Kokoschka, and Henry Moore. The first meeting of the Jerusalem Committee took place in July 1969 in Jerusalem. The participants were from many different professional backgrounds. There were architects, artists, politicians, university professors, theologians, philosophers, publishers, and archaeologists, and they were from many different countries. Open to views and options from the outside Israel, the Jerusalem Committee was indeed a remarkable, ambitious, multinational exercise, and even in the participants' own eyes, the organization of this multinational cooperation appeared a unique, courageous, and hopeful attempt to overcome racial and religious antagonism and political conflicts in the turbulent days after the World War II. While the preparatory work of the authorities in connection with the rehabilitation and reconstruction of the city and protection of important sites appeared to the members to be both varied and far-sighted, they were at the same time well aware of the fact that those works and plans had to be carefully examined by experts in the field of urban design and architecture. As the complexity of symbolism of these powers of the Song of Songs increased, increased in Christian iconography, the image of the Virgin Mary as the Garden of Heaven, consisted by various symbolical flowers, became particularly significant. The source of this image in the Song of Songs reads, I quote, a garden enclosed, sister my bride, a garden enclosed, a fountain shield, quote it. Related to this praise of the body of the bride of the Song of Songs, the womb of the Virgin Mary was thought to symbolize the garden, and the pure beauty of her womb realized the mystery of incarnation. The theological background of characteristics of the Virgin Mary that were transformed into scenes closely related with the medieval hermeneutics of the Bible to interpret the image in multiple ways. For example, the Garden of the Heaven was represented on the ceiling of Christian churches. The ceiling of St. Mihail's church in Bamberg was renewed in circa 610, and it is a well-known example. According to Werner Dressendorfer, Lily of Barry represents the characteristics of the Virgin Mary as the bride of the Song of Songs. Adding this, next is the apple tree and the pearl tree, the symbols of the bride in the Song of Songs. These flowers of the Song of Song 
are also represented in the sculptures that adorn churches and cathedral and are often especially used to reference bridal mysticism. For example, the West Porta portal of the St. Elizabeth Church in Melbourne is filled with flowers and greens. There is a round stained, round stained glass in the chancel of the church that shows St. Elizabeth imitating the spring bride, Virgin Mary, as the bride of the of Sons. If a, listener, if a listener didn't manage to devote his whole attention to the structural basis of the composition, then he's, he has not been listening to music the right way, but solely hearing the oral characteristics of a musical work. Although this understanding of listening to music is attributed to several institutions, when explicating the consequences that arise uh, from the illustrative theoretical perspective when it comes to listening to popular music. Gresik usually refers exclusively to Karstik's aesthetic conception in his book on the musically beautiful, or the beautiful in music depends on the translation. The most important segment in Gresik's interpretation of the thesis of active listening is his analysis of the ways in which it could challenge the aesthetic perception of popular music. Taking into account that the aim of the advocates of this thesis, Hanslick himself, was not to question the possibility of genuine aesthetic experience of popular music. Hanslick is not talking about popular music at all. Gracie believes that there are at least three negative consequences of uh, this conception as far as listening of popular music is concerned. I will briefly present these consequences in the next few minutes and point out the way in which they are related to the problems of aesthetic experience of form in popular music composition. As the first consequence of active listening thesis, Grace emphasizes the problem of knowledge allegedly needed for an adequate reception. If genuine aesthetic perception of popular music, uh, I quote Grace here, always requires conscious exercise of critical categories concerning the musical form, end quote, then it can be brought into question whether listeners of popular music actually listen to the composition of this kind. Grace responds to these conceptions by showing that listeners of rock music do comprehend the main characteristics of composition they listen to so that their listening to this style of music does not require any special knowledge for proper aesthetic reception. Good morning and welcome everybody. I am uh, Dimitri Patrick and uh, I will present you a collaborative work with my colleague, uh, Dr. Maria Mira, uh, which we are both uh, uh, assistant professors in the Department of um, Theater Architecture at the University of uh, West Africa in Athens, Greece. So, a short outline of the presentation that concerns the production and proposal and implementation of ideas, some case studies, and some conclusions. The, the complex character of urban uh, places renders difficult the recognition and possession of their multivariate and fragmented aesthetic characters. They encompass a vivid, expandable universe in constant motion of aesthetic, collective, and cultural revolution. <coughs> Living in or visiting a typical urban environment has a fragmented engagement with different physical, historical, collective, aesthetic parts of the city. Urban sites reveal the various, the various ways people experience and engage their surrounding buildings. Among the most important questions within understanding and representing cities are first, the constant evolution of urban places as a dynamic palimpsest, and second, the dynamic field of collective social and historic forces that say by and say cities. Literature reveals and resynthesizes the separate layers and diverse fragments that are embedded in any urban landscape in its relevant contextual situation, being aesthetic, history, social, cultural, or collective memory. Authors can echo poetics 
towards real places, but also they can make possible the emergence of the subjective experience of places. Narrative text spaces do not express a closed motionless reality within the fictional framework. Urban environments are in constant change, primarily in the course of the plot's evolution and their participating characters who perceive and experience them through different psychological, emotional and social situations. Novels reading provide strong bodily enactment. A mind opening to the vivid and always becoming collective social, cultural potential, surprise and aesthetic awareness of urban worlds. Narrative descriptions include and provide diverse forms of urban and rural spatial information within particular semantically and aesthetically encoded contexts. Uh, aesthetic education uh, is, is never quite simply about aesthetics understood as pertaining to the realm of fine arts, nor is it simply about education understood as pedagogical instruction uh, or intellectual upbringing. Rather, it's about completing and reconciling the disparate parts of the individual. What Schiller calls his play drive completes the human being. The completion of the human uh, that Schiller aims to address at an individual level, however, finds its correlate at the social level as well. After narrowing his focus on what could be called the artificial or the non natural forms of beauty, that is, the fine arts, Schiller identifies the aim and the telos of his letters. He writes, quote, is it not at least unseasonable to be looking around for a code of laws for the aesthetic world when the affairs of the moral world provide an interest that is so much keener and the spirit of philosophical inquiry is, through the circumstances of the time, so vigorously challenged to concern itself with the most perfect of all works of art, the building up of true political freedom, end quote. So while the play drive reconciles the disparate parts of the human being, bringing together the various drives in order to complete that being, the human being, a so-called social animal, what Kant called unsocial sociability, can only be reconciled with itself if it is reconciled with others in a political unity. The most perfect work of art for Schiller is not even a work of art, but rather political legislation, thereby escaping the Kantian trap that perfection cannot apply to a judgment of the beautiful. So while play unites the human being, play as a drive facilitates the awakening of higher faculties of the human that allow unity at the level of the social and political. How is this achieved and why continue calling it then aesthetic education? The answer is found in a curious and potentially vicious circle, bookending the second letter, where Schiller first claims, quote, art is the daughter of freedom, and then towards the end he writes, if we're to solve the political problem in practice, follow the path of aesthetics, since it is through beauty that we arrive at freedom. Now, on the one hand, that's an end of the quote, on the one hand, Schiller presents freedom or autonomy as the progenitor of art. This is due to the fact, as Hegel will reiterate, art is twice born of spirit. While nature might be conceived as a creation of the divinity, it is inert matter equated with gravity and the antithesis of freedom. As self-consciousness is itself born of spirit, the creations of self-consciousness understood to be a creation of spirit the second time around, even if and when mimicking natural occurrences. But of course, this, this uh, new technology, uh, since I'm not a technological determinist, this new technology just triggers uh, new artistic inventions, uh, uh, which maybe could be in some way possible before, but it, it makes, how to say, the whole history of art and aesthetics different. And one, one of, of many, of course, uh, very visible uh, cases is this last uh, film from uh, Rush from Trier, the house that Jack built, you know, the film about the serial killer and so on. And here you can see that he, he reinterprets art and what, uh, in, 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 this, in this film. And through this, uh, you say, perverted psychology of his main character, he gets to the notion of the art as uh, the framework for evil. We would like to introduce you, my colleague Shevchik, a uh, contribution under the title uh, Jose Gilles Concept uh, of the Space of the Body uh, and its Applicability to Various Kinds of Art. Uh, in the contribution, uh, we will be with the thoughts of uh, contemporary Portuguese philosopher and aesthetician Jose Gilles. <laughs> In particular, we will introduce Gilles' concept of the space of the body. Uh, Gilles, 
promoving the philosophy of French post-structuralist Gilles and Felix Corbery, uh, stresses uh, that there is not only body as an uh, organic unity and closeness, but also body as becoming transformation and development. Uh, according to Gilles, dancers move in a particle space, uh, which is different from an objective space. However, the body of dancer uh, does not simply move in such particle space, rather it creates, literally, the body of the dancer emanates into such space. The space of the body is thus to be conceived as inner outer space. It is necessary to see to regard the body of the dancer as an uh, identified phenomenon uh, which moves in objective Cartesian space. Instead, it is to be understood as a meta-phenomenon, or rather a transformer of time and space. We suggest that in Gilles concept of the space of the body, we zonize uh, Morris' uh, melancholy concepts uh, of corporeality. Uh, melancholy claims that the body does not necessarily have to be in space, because in fact it is space already. The majority of contemporary artists had moved towards science and surrendered the track towards art to a few who yearn for the old art. Which artists and philosophers waged such a struggle have all the great minds gone over to science? Who remains for philosophy and art? The mediocre, the few. Of course, there are no notable exceptions. Deep down, what is, being, what is being persecuted is genius, talent, inspiration, diversity, anything that cannot be assimilated by rationality. Immanuel Kant's attitude to genius is characteristic. Genius does not concern the scientist, but only the artist, as in science, known and clear rules that determine its methods take precedence. By contrast, genius is unable to describe the course it has followed thus far. It does, it, it does not know how its ideas occur to it, nor can it produce its ideas whenever it wishes, nor give to others instruction as to how they can attain it as not of good, nor pass on to others all the steps followed. In science, there is, a continue, there is continuous progress towards knowledge. By contrast, the skill of genius cannot be taught and dies along with it. Kant believes that imagination and intellect collaborate and join forces in art and in genius. In a work of art, good taste is more important than genius, just as the power of judgment is more important than imagination according to Kant, because the presentation of art does not need to be so rich and original in terms of ideas. What is needed is for the imagination to be free to play with the laws of understanding. The Kami is just a metaphor to explain this status. Suppose you are walking down, a robot jumps out and offers you the following choice, your money or your life. You may have no choice but to give up your money to leave because if you choose to keep your money, the robot puts the trigger. The Kang names this situation as the bell of Elite. Bell is a Latin word for bell. Yet there is only one choice. The result of the choice would be a life, now diminished by a specific dollar amount. The choice is therefore rather forced upon you, and the Kang's point is that so is me. The subject faces similar choice with respect to its being and its meaning. In other words, the status of subject is the symbolic meaning at the expense of the real existence. Therefore, Lacan defines the subject as the split itself between the meaning and the existence. He summarizes this situation as follows, quote, If we reach its being, the subject disappears, it loses us, it falls into no meaning. If we choose meaning, the meaning survives only deprived of that part of the non-meaning, that is, strictly speaking, 
the basic constitutes in the realization of the subject, the unconscious, and quote. It is time to go back to the original question of Lacan. What is the seeing of subject? As the subject is the split between meaning and being, the seeing of subject is the split between the eye and the gaze. The eye can be represented by the Cartesian thesis, I see myself seen. Or the eye corresponds to the consciousness of modern subject who coordinates the entire world, transparently including itself. This is an entire configuration of medicine. The world consists of three parts, A, B, and C. A is the same of medicine, B is the same of life, and C is the same of love for two people. Please listen to each thing. This is A. Sparse. 
were too much brought in only one paper on her, but she discussed rather critics on her than on her, than on her activity itself. On this structural pattern reflects people's conclusion in Song Dynasty about plant growth, cultivation, and the attributes. This mode of combination and structure is unique to Qianlan. The second is the book named Hua Guang Plum Blossom Spectrum. It's about archetype theory in plant expression. According to the Book of Changes, everything in the world is divided into yin and yang. For example, Flowers of plant open to the sun, its nature is young, its roots deeply in the ground, the roots nature is in. Uh, when I took this picture, I felt that spirit more deeply. That is the spirit of worship, of young and loving in is embodied everywhere in Chinese culture. Uh, a plum blossom in a Qianquan or Taiji, that is the universe. We can see some people seek truth from flowers and uh, plants. For example, uh, one painted for the base of flower, which symbolizes the Taiji, means the beginning. Three painted for palace. Is represented the three elements of heaven, earth, and human kinds. Human beings. Five painted for petals, a symbol of the five elements of gold, wood, water, fire, and earth. Seven used to paint the stamens. Nine is reference to the largest lambo. Means various. That is the flower, the blossom for the blossom force. Adorno draws on the specific structure Leibniz gives to the moment. Its windowless isolation from the other units on the one hand and on the other, its ability to reflect the harmonic principles, the harmonic principle that arranges the self-contained units into a whole. Yet at the same time, he radicalizes the isolation of the moment. To, uh, to the point where it is no longer simply a part of the whole, but an alien object that reflects the world's disharmony, displacing the harmony to the status of a promise. The idea that the whole is present in each part has a long tradition, but the moment is not simply a part. It only reflects the whole on the condition that it is a part that has no place within the whole, a part with no part, so to speak. Of course, I'm cheating here a bit, but this again brings me close to my final, final reference, which is Jacques Concierge, for whom uh, politics happens when the part with no part takes the place of the whole. But in his aesthetic thought as well, he documents the aesthetic regime of art through scenes of, I quote, great displacement through which any part becomes a totality and any, and any totality plays the role of a part. So among these scenes, we find Winkelmann's appreciation of the Belvedere torso precisely as a mutilated statue, a fragment proliferating into a multiplicity of unknown bodies. Or Rilke's description of how Rodin's sculptures of hands accomplish the artistic task of making a world from the smallest part of a thing. So compared to Adorno's moments, the fragmentary object of the aesthetic regime is no longer merely a monument to the world's disharmony, but rather a detached part out of which a different construction of the whole can be extracted. So in a way, Rancière activates the moment. But what does the moment do? It uses its isolation to reframe the fictional fabrics that constitute the world. For Rancière, I quote, a fiction is not the invention of an imaginary world. Instead, it is the construction of a framework within which subjects, things, situations can be perceived as coexisting in a common world. So the loose parts, alienated from the framework, that proliferate into unknown new frameworks, could be described as monadic objects uh, that turn out to be precisely windows, 
windows on another kind of world, on another kind of linkage uh, that connects uh, subject things and situations. As we have already seen from the first quote, Deleuze is confident that Kandinsky's concept of movement comes short of multiplicity. Moreover, he notices a prevalence of binary oppositions such as vertical white activity and horizontal black inertia in Kandinsky's art and admits Francis Bacon's claim that contrary to Kandinsky's own definition of abstract painting by tension, that uh, tension is what abstract painting loves the most. By internalizing tension in the optical form, after painting neutralized it. So the question arises why the versus opinion of Kandinsky is so one sided. We know uh, that a few periods in Kandinsky's creation are distinguished. And, uh, uh, maybe there is, uh, is true about the Bauhaus, Bauhaus period in Kandinsky's creation. But in the beginning of the 20s, Kandinsky started, uh, but uh, when he started working at Bauhaus, uh, his language was rational and geometric. But earlier, plenty of his after. Uh, works were intense, dynamic, colorful compositions. And finally, these compositions created during the Paris period return to more organic, free, and even fabulous paintings. In China, we have a very similar tradition, and uh, we say art, that it means two characters. One is E, but another is so. There are two characters cut together. We say E so means art. But this is a translation. Of course, this is translation. But it has, uh, it has our a similar. Why we Chinese choose these two words to translate? Probably at the beginning, is some Japanese do that. Do that. But the Japanese received these words that is from China, and that is. In the China, we always use these words, yi and so. The first I talk about the yi, the blue word, the third word. Yi, from, you know, Chinese, <laughs> how to say, uh, it just looks like, the characters look like one person who is designed to plant a tree on the earth. To plant a tree, as we know, China is an agricultural country. It is important. Uh, uh, it is uh, to plant something which is very important. This is from this we say develop such a word, such a five, uh, six words. Or we say six arts. That means uh, like uh, we say six arts means here, means uh, ritual, music, actually, energy driving, calligraphy, and the mathematics. These six, we say, it is art. Of course, that is not the modern understanding of this. And then, this, this word have also have its long tradition but it is simple to uh, have these connections with some, do something practical, do different practical things. It also become uh, the, the curriculum in teaching uh, pupils to learn six arts. The GPS with Kibera visibility to a global audience in the field with how residents perceive and read, and read their place. Kibera's participatory cartography despite bottom up bottom up designs of many tools that has a purpose, which purpose remains unclear, along with the improvement of living condition. It seems that alongside humanitarian, humanitarian aid, it has also triggered the interest of the touristic spectacle. Kibera's problems and real challenges are turning into a worldwide spectacle to poverty. The reason Kibera has chosen, has chosen in this paper is because 
this paper argues that the mapping method uh, has a negative impact on the mapped space and that becomes clear in the, in the slum city. The sophisticated technological way that modern world looks and uh, maps the slum city forms a relation of power. Foucault said that knowledge and power are inextricably linked. After 10 years of the Kibera mapping, there are no intention of giving property rights, only temporary solutions. The basic problem in both humanistic and linguistic approach is that they are both present orientated. This results in having the real living condition detached from, it, from its context, independent from its past and future situation. The digital map are, make, are making links of direct associations of touch or nodes, but they lost the real meaning of the locations. That is what we can really learn from Kibera about the meaning of place and design. The digital open source map, as any other map, is just a tool that serves specific purposes. And in the case of Kibera, these specific purposes remain, remain not in the hand of the people. Thank you. In this founder's perspective, he thought his tendency to use it very negatively. But in the Raoul's uh, perspective of learning the boundaries, uh, she said Tandu stopped in the in the time difference over cultural, cultural boundary between East and West, and he just stopped. So his his the, his uh, aesthetics is very interesting and meaningful. So, but in the time that his music has uh, uh, his music to dream the music that the without boundaries, but he. I also emphasize on the music counterpoint when I met Han Dun at, um, last year. He said music counterpoint is the very important factor in my music. So Han Dun knew he, his, he, his music has boundaries in the work, but he doesn't uh, emphasize on it in the make, um, press. And uh, it, <laughs> it is all <laughs> negative perspective of our time this music. First, neo-orientalist is the John Corbett's definition. Um, it is um, reflected at the size orientalism. This that Tan Dun uh, make the music like orientalist Western composer like John Cage or yeah. So uh, he's a neo-orientalist who make the music like their their methodology like the Western composer. So I think uh, it's very negative definition, and the global citizen um, is, is a good good point. And the modern mind is very negative because Tandun do the music of uh, the which is um, good listen to the American American people, and the flexible citizen um, means he he is. He has nationality, but um, for the popularity, he changed the citizenship <laughs> whenever he wants to um, um, get the population. So yeah, this this negative perspective has the um, uh, li limit for me. So I introduced the high quality person definition uh, to to the book. It was very broad concept in his. The cultural hybridity, but the hybridity concept um, it is easier to focus on his his counterpoint, uh, which can see the cultural differences. But in the Orientalism perspective, uh, we can uh, see the difference between culture cultures. So I I <laughs> I focus on the hybridity, and it looks like they are very um, positive to time. <laughs> On the occasion of the preliminary course, Eaton stated, quote, My goal is to awaken in people the sense for the essence of things, end of quote. Instead of finding a new style in the field of visual arts, there was an effort to determine the elementary components of visual expression that would have general comprehensibility and applicability. The educational goal of the preliminary course was that each individual, whether it is a future artist, designer, or architect, learn how to solve design problems from the very foundation, from the elementary technological specificity of the material he works with, from functionality of specific form, and from the capability of human being to observe fundamental environmental relations. 
In this way, during the process of design, the artist, the designer, or architect always proceeded not from some unique aesthetic model, but from concrete technical conditions, material functions, and the natural psychological laws of human being. It was not merely a craft philosophy, nor it was simply a functional philosophy limited to the practical or to industry. It was explicitly an aesthetic philosophy resting on psychological investigations. What belonged to the area of psychological research that fundamentally determined the educational and creative practice of the Bauhaus was the idea of Gestalt. The meaning of the known Gestalt in the literal translation is a form or in a narrow sense a creative form, while the term Gestaltung denotes the shaping or creation of a form. However, the meaning of this term was determined by the complex connotations in the cultural deposits that had already settled in Germany since Goethe and especially intensified during the first decades of the 20th century. This period represents the renaissance of Gestalt theory in Germany thanks to its operation in the field of psychology and philosophy. For example, Max Wertheimer founded the Gestalt psychology schools in 1912. The basis of Gestalt in the field of perception theory was the idea of a comprehensive reception. The totality as such exists, but its value is not equal to the sum of the elements that make it, but the observation of the whole tends to take the best possible form, while simple, symmetrical, and consistent forms are the best forms. The implications of the meaning of the term Gestalt, as it was actualized in the framework of the Bauhaus, certainly led to Goethe's theoretical use of this term, given the importance that Goethe's theory of color had for many Bauhaus members, especially for Eaton, Kandinsky, Klee, and Klee, and Schlimmer. Schlimmer not only read Goethe, but also the work of Carl Gustav Karls and the work of Ludwig Klages, both of whom developed their vitalist ideas from Goethe's theory. Studies of both Karls and Klages were listed in Schlemmer's list for a psychology lecture book within the main course, making six of the, thir of the 13 recommended books for this segment of the main course. Goethe introduced the Gestalt concept to 19th century German thought. His Gestalt theory concerned the establishment of the ideal type theory, according to which all complex structures, plants, or animals are transformations from a single fundamental organ. Goethe accounted for similarities among the members of the species by formal process of self-organization ultimately derived from an ideal type he called an Urbild. In Goethe's morphology, the term Gestalt referred to the self-actualizing wholeness of organic forms. His theory took into account the dynamism and the variability of life, identifying among these dynamism universalities and constants. Goethe's ideal morphological types are both real and immaterial. This paradox was resolved in the Bauhaus precisely by the Gestaltung concept. The unification of the material, material and the material world, rationality, nature, intuition and technique, art and crafts in the designing process. Today I want to think from examples from the Americas from authoritarian contexts and their aftermaths in the 18, uh, 1980s and 1990s to suggest something about how we can turn to history, how we can think about memory, how we can think about turning to each other rather than turning to the nation state, these horizontal networks of affiliation, and what forms of sociality might we look towards as we reinvent politics, right? So subversive aesthetics is not about the usual or politics as usual. But for me, it's about reaching below and beyond the nation state. And I know I say that in a time of very acute nationalism. So what does it mean to actually think about that? So let me give you a little bit of context. My early work very much focused, as Marina said, on the politics of memory in the aftermath of violence. And in the, my first book, Where Memory Dwells, 
Um, as a Chilean exile, I was very concerned with going back to Chile and considering the places of culture, the memorials, the former torture centers, uh, the sites of massacre, um, not only as contested spaces that are rife with social movements and struggle over historical memory, but also as places where conservative politics instantiated themselves, okay? Um, places where ideologies of nationhood and stateness actually took hold in the restructuring of the nation, such as this, the National Museum of Memory and Human Rights, where there was a kind of absorption of what human rights paradigm was. So there was a rebuilding of the nation through memory politics, and I would just warn us about this, given the con con context in Latin America. Um, Part of my work was to actually conclude that political democracy has to smooth over the wound, right, of the recent past in order to produce a sense of national cohesion, national identity, amidst a deeply traumatized society still reeling from collective violence. And here, the work of the mothers of the disappeared and their work in the context of Peace Park memorials and human rights effort actually allowed for a deeper reaching in into the national subconscious. So there's something about a public feminism or a, a public embodiedness that's really important. The mothers of the disappeared produced new image structures, and they narrated an embodied experience, and I'll return to that again and again in my presentation and comments, um, a personal encounter, right, with torture, with violence, with a proximity to disappearance, and bringing forth submerged memories. I, I like to think about the kind of undercurrents rather than just the submersive, what lies underneath the submerged memories of collective violence. So one point is to suggest in those early transition years to democracy in the early 1990s and under the smooth narrative of the quote unquote neoliberal economic miracle that was supposedly Chile, right? This was against the interest of political elites to consider anything but a punto final or a final point on the modern wound uh, of state terror that has actually colonial roots. And I think we often kind of write out, you know, we think about modernity as violent and forget the kind of underlying uh, project of coloniality. I don't know about your country. In my place, it is like that. But of course, if I was married, I wouldn't come across and say, yeah, look at this guy, he doesn't do anything, I'm the head of the family. No, 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 you can't play the game like that. You say, yes, he's my husband, You're very, he's very important. If he was not there, I don't know where I would be. But I'm the one who will get a job, earn the money, build a house, and he'll go to the pub, and as he takes one drink after another, he'll be saying, yeah, I have built for my family. If I was not there, and we women, we don't mind it. We just continue like that. We'll go to school. Um, the women, there will be more women with PhDs compared to the men. But if I am married and I begin to earn more money than my husband, my marriage will be on the rocks. Domestic violence or not violence or domestic indifference will creep in. So what do we do? Many women of my age, after some time you don't accept promotions at work. You tell them, no, 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 don't promote me. You can give me that money as benefits. You can, but just don't promote me because I can't be earning more than he does. On the other hand, if it is degrees, you say, no, 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 I, I, he has a master's and I want to do a PhD. No, I, I can't do it. And you just don't do it. It took me seven years to do a simple PhD. And it took me that long because uh, one day my supervisor, an older, you know, like Professor Curtis, about that age, he asked me, Lydia, why, who is going to marry you after this degree? And I said, how, how, how does that, what's a connection between that and studying Nairobi? He told me, ooh, I got the hint. I went to a jeweler's shop, bought a ring, put on the ring, and the next time I went, things started moving. My proposal made sense. And I mean, it's not like a, a fake story, but that's actually what happened. Eventually, I studied, I even published a book, and that, that, that was OK. So you don't, I mean, in Kenya, and those last four decades I've given you, 
the woman has to get things going, but you zip it, you shut up, you don't do it. You hold on to masculinity, and he's only the head of the family, and you continue. So for me, that the artist has been painting his mother. I mean, of course, it's not his, his mother, but uh, he's been painting that person, the generic person, for that long, made sense. For me, he's paying homage to the work that the Kenyan woman has had to do to build that society. You don't have to agree with my interpretation. Um, but what I have here are examples of his artwork. And the cloth we are wearing there, that's what you call the kanga, the leso. Um, whenever people come to Kenya or to Tanzania, a bit also in uh, Somalia, they make sure they buy a kanga. It's very iconic. And as I told you, it has a lot of history. Now, what is interesting here is that he has located it in Lamu. Lamu is a town, UNESCO heritage site. It's a town on the coast of Kenya. And in the first part of the 20th century, civilization in that part of the country was always studied as something from outside. So we got civilized from the coast going into the hinterland. The Arabs brought a mode of life. Later on, the Europeans came. So that's where he positions his painting. He gives it context. It begins to tell you history. You can see this, uh, this is very, the coast is Islamized, even in their dress. And you can use the kanga like a buibui. A buibui is the women's, women's dress. So you tie up here and also the bottom. Sometimes when I was doing research, I walked into a mosque. Uh, of course, I didn't last very long. I used the wrong entrance. I did. I mean, I wasn't aware. So somebody just came and collected me from the corner and deposited me outside. And I thought, oh, I had not taken the photos. Then I thought, oh, I have to survive. I went to a shop. I bought two. They always sold in doubles the kangas. I tied myself. And this time I walked in. And I took as many photos as I wanted. The power of dress. In Mexico, Acha was a key player in the history of the Museum of Modern Art of Mexico, MAM. During the management of director Fernando Gabor, he began writing the plural magazine. Next to Octavio Paz, and also played a fundamental role as a professor at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, and as an official of the National Institute of Fine Arts. In the critical text that Acha published in the plural before it was closed, in 1972, he defended the need to look at the Latin American visual tradition from its abstract and geometric intellectual roots, or the desire for rationality in Latin American art, perhaps in response, in response from the aesthetics to the problem of underdevelopment. Juan Achan posed the question, why not overcome the addition to political passion in art, social realism, a certain sense to the self exoticism that had been used by different painter, painters of the first half of the 20th century in Latin America. In this way, he defended their revitalization and recognition of this rationalist but sensitive line in Latin American art. Some ideas to highlight of his aesthetic thinking. Acha assumes art as a complex sociocultural process that implies three basic activities in its enact production, distribution, and consumption. This approach to cultural reality is similar to of the historic and dialectic materialism as it is proposed by Marx. In this way, he prefers to speak of art not as an exclusive object of the aesthetics, but as aesthetics reality, which includes handicraft and artistic products, as well as contemporary designs. The arts, in plural, have to be assumed as one of the three systems of artistic production. Handicrafts, which are also known as 
pre-Renaissance or feudal art in Europe, and as popular for gift handicraft in Latin America, educated the second, educated scholarly Renaissance or just arts. The third, technological arts, industrial, industrial, which are included under the denomination of designs. The three handicrafts are the designs are the system which produce produce images, action and object of Western aesthetic structure. I open quotation. There is nothing new or arbitrary about our interest in the free system of artistic production. We have become accustomed to scholars addressing only traditional high art, but there is no shortage of studies on the individual existence of this system. It is irrelevant if they are described as mass media instead of design, a popular art instead of craft. These are some examples of uh, uh, materials connected with the theory of films, and uh, uh, it's important to notice that uh, theory of film was uh, uh, um, uh, practiced uh, during uh, uh, Bauhaus period, but not any films were made by professors or students uh, during uh, the time of Bauhaus. So these are some uh, 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 photos from uh, that film where uh, the, uh, you can see persons uh, around the school and some cooperation I made to, work, uh, to add photos of, uh, uh, let's say, Luke Spininger. Uh, to compare how uh, other students treated uh, the same materials on some on one way. Uh, this is the famous terrace and cafe, which Ivan also made the photos of, but it's also included in film. Activities on the beach, and of course that balconies. Where architecture of a Bauhaus building is shown in one more take as the camera moves along the known balconies. The film last take, the end, and the caption is a parody of popular way of any motion pictures at the time. The film is very short, it runs for less than one minute and seems like a chance recording shot in passing. However, uh, the change of rhythm in editing, the footage of people doing various things, and the recognizable shots of the school's, ar the school's architecture all suggested that the work of uh, that it is a work of art uh, which was uh, very carefully conceived. Most takes in the film have counterparts in photography taken uh, by Ivana or others. The people in front of Ivana's camera are gesticulating laughing, enjoying drinks, uh, having a relaxing good time at the party of the riverbank. The building, the Bauhaus trademark, has a role as a setting for the breakfast in the terrace scene or in a uh, precisely framed shot showing the balcony. The film's final take confirmed that this deliberate work has its own rhythm, beginning and end. This film by Ivana Tomljenovic is a unique work of art Although some uh, Bauhaus teachers stressed the importance of film and in theory laid the uh, groundwork for the language of film, the media never gained the foothold at the school. Uh, the reasons were uh, mainly financial, as film production at that time was quite expensive. In the 20s, Oskar Schlemmer had formulated the idea of Bauhaus cinema. Laszlo Moho and Naj attempted to establish uh, S uh, test center for cinematic art, but to not, uh, not avail. At the time of the Bauhaus activists, this only a few films recordings were made, and the film by Ivana Tomljenovic which is unique work by students throughout its years of operation. If the desire for the venture and the quest for something new had played an important part in Ivana Sarano uh, in Dessau, her departure from the school was a result of combination of political tensions in Germany. Even I was left, left winger uh, by uh, conviction, close to communist idea. She uh, held the membership card of the German Communist Party issued in the name of uh, Virinia Helz to, pro to provide some cover for his, uh, her conspir uh, conspiration of operation. 
She maintained ongoing contacts with several well-known members of the illegal Communist Party of Yugoslavia. Her departure from the Bauhaus was directly caused uh, caused by a student travel against the length of pre uh, preliminary course, but the overall background of this situation was formed by political tensions between communists and Nazis, who were growing increasingly stronger. The conflict culminated in the dismissal of Hannes Meyer from the position of, as director of the Bauhaus and his departure along with several students to Moscow. The architect Nis van der Rohe was appointed as his successor. He strove to get the Bauhaus out of political conflicts, so the students were forbidden to engage in any political activities. Upon her departure from uh, Bauhaus, Ivana stayed in Berlin for a short while. Looking for a job, she found employment as an assistant stage designer with the Piscator Wiener, a theater group led by Erwin Piscator. During her work on the stage design, she collaborated with John Hartfield, well known for his graphic design for books published by Malik Verlag, and even more for his photomontages in the Arbeiter Illustrierte Zeitung. This collaboration with Hartfield provided the context for even a further work. At that time, the political situation in Yugoslavia was deterior uh, deteriorating uh, after dictatorship was imposed by King uh, Alexander Karadjordjevic in 1929. The so-called January of Six dictatorship dissolved uh, uh, parliament and prohibited all politi political parties and trade union, uh, unions. Political meeting, meetings were banned and uh, censorship was introduced. Political in the police intimidation intent intensified and political opponents were sent to prison, tortured and or killed. <clears throat> At the beginning of 1930, a group of prominent left-wing intellectuals in Berlin, led by writer Otto Michaili Berin, mounted in their Sturmgalerie a uh, docum documentary exhibition on the repression in Yugoslavia. Even Tomljenovic visited the exhibition and received copies of the photographs uh, and documents displayed from the exhibition organizer. She used this material to produce a uh, uh, powerful propaganda tool, a photo collage showing King, King Alexander uh, standing over the dead body of Yekoslav uh, Slavko Oreshki with the police report about the uh, death of Juro Djakovic and Nikola Kecimovic visible in the uh, background. Your cases that you presented, it's very interesting for me to see that these two cases that are really actual also as queer, queer in the nation, anti-normativity, depatriarchality, this is easy. It's nobody directly approach you. But I, I, in a certain way, like a question, like how you can show us these things, you know, these gay, these faggots here, and we know the uh, history, uh, practically, uh, the ex Yugoslavia in general was, it's, and it's a uh, homophobic, patriarchal uh, 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 setting. So it's really strongly uh, present, all these homophobic actions. As I said in 2001, people were beaten. They almost risked their life. I mean, this is not just to be against but means actually going up with your body in the street. And today these things are much present in the European context. So uh, the first uh, um, uh, case, and thank you for presenting these two cases, because they are also actual for the European context. For example, the, the second case is the fat body, uh, the, the reluctance, the, the, the antagonism that the fat body is producing in the West uh, for me was uh, something uh, unbelievable. All this avant-garde, this talk, but you have, for example, in Austria, positions, feminist, uh, um, uh, non uh, 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 feminist, but also um, uh, gender and transgender positions because of their corpulent body, of their body who is really performative. They had actually trouble. They are white, not to speak uh, father, and we will come to race because race is also very important, they actually face the ultimate uh, disqualification, violence, 
on unbelievable proportion today, in these days, in, in the European context and so on. So my question is, these two cases, uh, uh, this uh, that you grasp for us, uh, how much was the question of provoking antagonism? How that space that you make a research actually reacted uh, to the, such works? Uh, for example, um, the, the, uh, this uh, beginning of queering the nation, uh, exposing, I don't need this, I am, as you started with the, the poem that was very powerful. How, how this function? I mean, I mean, what is the change? Because we hear also a huge problem today in Latin America, in Brazil. So. And I started by considering the anti-gender rhetoric that we're hearing from you know, Bolsonaro and this kind of idea right, of new logics of uh, binary <laughs> gender opposed to non-normative queer sexuality, opposed to, say, female masculine bodies or trans bodies. So, you know, we're seeing a kind of reactionary moment in the nation state as central to authoritarianism. But for those of us, and many of, of those, you know, of us in the room have experienced authoritarianism, we know that these are not disattached, like detached logics. They actually travel together. That's my point about the kind of monocultural, you know, uh, project. I did choose these two very specific moments, and I open by saying this is a moment in the 1980s, 1990s, this is kind of the neoliberal turn. This is a parallel moment to our, our times in some ways, you know, and when and everything's possible, but there's also a shadow over everything and a kind of new moment of capitalist logic, right? So in that moment, there is a way in which the non-normative body produces uh, an enunciation and produces a kind of contestation in front of like I mentioned, gentrification, or the racialization of the state, or police surveillance in the context of Lara Aguilar, even her disability, the fact that she's working class, she didn't get um, a retrospective until you know, a year before she passed away. You know, these kinds of ways in which the working class brown mestiza. But I also think that there's a way in which we're not taking into consideration, and I often find this actually in a, in a number of different settings, what Chicana feminism is offering us, right? And I know uh, in parts of Europe, there's a kind of turn to thinking with Chicana feminism. I think that's an important turn because Chicana feminists, you know, Laura Aguila include as queer feminists, have often complicated a kind of black-white binary or indigenous, non-indigenous, or two nations, you know, certain ethnicities against each other. That's the other antagonism here. The unspoken antagonism is the mestiza body complicating that, the colonial wound. So it's not only modernization, I think modernization is one aspect to go back to the previous question, but what are the strata, the strata of memory, right? Memory, memories that underlie the kind of, just the, the project of modernity, and it is that colonial wound, right? Um, for many parts of the world, and I don't know how that functions exactly in this context. Um, but one last point is La Mavelle and the complication of the history of Marxism, right? So being a communist, but what does it mean to stand with and outside of those kind of political left histories as well? Okay, uh, I think it was another question for you. Yeah, please, and then I will do it. Yeah, please. Um, can, can you please? Uh, 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 maybe it is for all of you. So um, how or how much is this uh, militarized aesthetics that you uh, frame the work with, inspired by or colludes with the forensic term that is the creative expression that overwhelms uh, arts in the region? Uh, you, you, you also <laughs> did with this. I think the question. Yeah, it's no. Uh, I mean, uh, we, uh, we, we still are uh, waging this war. Uh, I can uh, rephrase uh, here famous uh, saying from Clausewitz and say that peace is continuation in this context of ex Yugoslavia of the war with other means. So uh, uh, the war just moved to those institutions, but the same ethnocentric logic and the same economy that was running the war in the first place is uh, uh, still uh, uh, here. We had a, a short period of normalization of relationship between Serbia and Croatia at the beginning of 2000 and uh, uh, I was 
a little bit happy at that time because this was very fake normalization, but nevertheless, maybe, I don't know. Uh, and uh, uh, now I see the Europe is turning towards those ethnocentric uh, politics. And uh, in a certain way, it looks like the text Yugoslavia was a, a kind of a, a, a playground. Uh, uh, I actually start with the uh, current uh, development of political situation in Europe to understand better the war, war in ex, uh, in ex uh, Yugoslavia. And uh, it's unbelievable, and, and this is the point where I'm still missing uh, uh, something to understand, uh, that those uh, uh, identitarian politics have a, a, a big revival. I thought uh, in certain contexts uh, 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 it's never going to happen again. And uh, uh, it happened in a, such a short time. So, uh, yeah. And when we talk about those, uh, uh, let's say, uh, performative forensics uh, uh, in my work, I, I think I have to dig deeper and deeper in order to see from this whole better the world. There is a very famous set design of Heinrich Miller for his production of Hamlet, Hamlet <laughs> Machine uh, from 90. Uh, 89 uh, from Deutsche Theater, and they had uh, as a backdrop uh, a view of Ophelia from the grave. And th I think this view is very precise one. It helps you very much to understand the world around you. The only problem is to get in the grave, we mo all know what has to happen before most of the time. Okay. <laughs> I mean, one of the um, videos that I didn't show today is actually from the Guatemalan artist, uh, Regina Galindo. And the work of Regina Galindo, can you hear me over that? Yes. Okay, the work of Regina Galindo is a you know, Guatemalan mestiza uh, woman who made um, a set of works for Documenta, and she calls it El Objetivo, or The Objective. And she literally puts herself running in the shadow um, in front of and in the shadow of a military tank and kind of barely outrunning that kind of almost uh, femme refusal, but you know, kind of being chased by, but outrunning, she's not a runner, the military tank that's impending you know, catastrophe, right? So that kind of idea, I mean, she's been critiqued on the one hand for reproducing the same apparatus that the US imperial government, you know, and the Central American kind of Guatemalan arm, armed forces, on the other hand, what she was doing, I think, is really, really important. In the site of Documenta, I don't know if people know, but um, uh, Castles was a kind of place of manufacturing weapons, right, during the Nazi regime. And it's often forgotten out of those art circuits and logic. So by bringing forward the kind of military machine, she's actually again calling attention to these kind of long histories of terror and the kind of global circulation. So, that kind of project seems to me, it's not so much, I feel like there's a, in the Q&A so far, there's been, you know, a kind of question about, but what if you do this strategy of representation, or what about this form? And actually, it's all context dependent. It's completely contingent about the context, right? What kind of might work in the particular moment to elucidate certain forms of state terror would be a reproduction, as Jonathan pointed out, right, that we were kind of this idea of a state logic in another context. So um, I just want to make that point because I feel like it's underlying some of the, the, the dialogue today. Yes, also just before giving the word, I, I don't, because we are pressed with time, but uh, of course uh, uh, we cannot solve and have all the answers, but I want it actually also to bring the insight in this story, because it's true, all depends on the context uh, in a certain way. And I don't want to leave this space without one context uh, that, uh, and this is not just a context, but it's really a place of, a uh, central place for understanding today what is this nation state, and this is actually uh, the racial colonial divide. I mean, what, when you talk about the racist state there in the uh, Latin American context, I think uh, in uh, uh, the European uh, Union or Europe as such, racism is something that is really uh, palpable because uh, it's a constant production of these others and uh, also those who are already here for second and third generations, for example, in um, uh, the colo uh, former colonial states uh, that are all also anti-Semitic uh, states, they are this racialization, this racist state is really palpable. 
and you uh, emphasize the gender and queer, uh, but uh, also what's uh, for uh, Galindo, what is for uh, your cases, it's the race, race as such, it's really uh, there. So how, how uh, this antagonism um, complicate? Uh, because uh, you, you, we have a lot of common normativity uh, today also, though in the Western world, that is a paradox after uh, the gay liberation, then you start to actually preach for the, for the nation. While those who are uh, this racial moment makes many who come out always discriminated, always push, always marginalized. Mm -hmm. I mean, your comment is really on point, and I think for a lot of us who are thinking about, you know, the, the context of the nation state, we're trying to mark that always, right? Um, with the racial state or capitalism, racial capitalism, to use Cedric Robinson's term and black Marxism, right? It's not just capitalism, but it's predicated upon, you know, certain racialized bodies, black bodies as fodder for a capitalist system, enslaved bodies, etc. So those rewriting and rethinking of longer histories of capitalism and the nation state, right? that go back to coloniality. And I would just point people, I do think in Europe, there's a kind of hiding of the racial state in particular ways in the discussion, despite its obvious xenophobia, despite the obvious racial stratification, despite the way in which there's an anti-blackness and anti-immigrant um, vibe in many parts of, of Europe. And I would point to Fatima al Taib's work, Europe's Others, uh, where she's really looking at queer and trans communities of color in Germany, say, um, and the ways in which they've struggled against this kind of project of white nationalism, and that's always part of their analysis. So it's not separate from, right, the kind of gender and sexual kind of normative gaze, but it's integral to social movements in a way I think we have to be much more conscious about and much more deliberate about the transformative potential to go back to Nefertiti's important point of, of these movements. So thank you for that comment. Yes, yeah. Because time is of the essence, three minutes before six. No, but we will... Uh, I'm just going to say something so we can count with the afterwards. Um, how about this one? Capitalist economy, pragmatically related to hyperproduction of all values, including this discourse, right. ultimately produces all diversities and all identities. Whether they are antagonistic towards each other, that's another question. That's actually the charity of our political system and lives, right? But ultimately, the capitalism economy is the true neo-colonialism, colonialistic power that is in fact producing diversity for the sake of just one cause or That's objective, to actually raise the confidence of consumers. And I would feel like that kind of locus of enunciation, that instantiation three minutes before the hour, That's not slightly erasing a lot of what's been said, a lot of what's been produced, certainly it's part of a certain kind of capitalist logic, but there are really, if, if we actually play out in social movements, some of the things that we are trying to suggest about um, differentiation, I think we go way beyond the comment you just made. So that's my time for the, um, the session. Maybe if I can just add to uh, one thing on this. Sure. Uh, I would like to quote Greg from Five Difficulties in Telling the Truth. He says that fascism is the final stage of uh, capitalism. And we can see this uh, in the concept of concentration camp where maximization of the profit comes to the point where human body and the fat is used uh, 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 as uh, material for different kinds of products and hair as, as well. And uh, uh, if we are not going to fight the cap, I, and when I'm talking about fascism, I'm not talking just about the historic fascism, but in the broader uh, uh, Michel Foucault's uh, uh, sense. So uh, if we are about to fight contemporary fascism, which really doesn't like to be called by that name, they learn very important lessons. Uh, uh, we have to fight first and foremost the capitalism, which is quite difficult today uh, because we are constantly, as you said, you point uh, uh, out to this uh, paradox, we are all the time in this process of producing more and more in less and less time. So it's one minute to six. And yeah, 